Okay, that was a frightful moment. Welcome everyone. And we're really excited to be hosting this talk today with uh, Mark Powell. And uh, we'll be starting in one or two minutes because it's a lot of people are joining now. So we're um, also uh, monitoring that here. And uh, welcome to the International Language Coaching Association Expert 2021 series, which we've been um, hosting every month this year. And we also did a series last year. And uh, we're looking forward to tonight's special guest, um, Mark Powell, who will be talking about what it, what it is to work in language coaching with uh, graphic facilitation. And uh, we'll see exactly what that means. Um, first of all, one or two words about um, ILCA. We've been working as a fantastic team with the board of members since 2019 to bring you lots of insights and clarification of what language coaching actually is. And uh, we're hoping that uh, you're going to gain some really, really um, interesting insights tonight. Uh, we'll be working about one hour on, on this today. And uh, I'd really like to uh, see where all of you are coming from. So I can see in the chat that we've got um, attendees here from Spain, Serbia, Germany, Crete, Israel, Mexico, wow. Canada, the USA, Brazil, Austria, um, Russia, Hungary. So we've got um, Virginia, USA. So we've got some fantastic um, uh, locations. I, I think we can say this is a global event and we're really excited. So I'm just going to hand it over to Mark Powell and uh, we're li really looking forward to it. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do encourage you to use the chat. So if you've got any questions or comments as we go along, then uh, we'd really um, love to hear from you. And uh, Mark said that we can even do the mic on, which means yeah. if you yeah, please do, please do, okay. <laughs> please talk to me. I, I, it's a big group. I know I can see that. I'm getting nervous already. I thought just doing a little talk on graphic guides, and I thought it's only going to be a handful of people. And we've got how many we got so far? 30, 30 oh God, and rising. Okay, well, yes, all right. I hope to justify your presence. Thanks very much for right. coming. Um, do talk to me if you want to. Yeah, because I'm not. I'm actually not used to working in Zoom at all. I've done lots of presentations, never really in Zoom. I teach on Zoom, but I don't do presentations to big groups on Zoom. And it's kind of strange having nothing coming back. I feel sort of lonely. Uh, so talk to me, please do, and encourage it in any way you possibly can, and I'll I'll get better as you encourage me. That's how it works usually. Also, I have to wear these John Lennon glasses, I'm afraid, um, for computer work. So sorry, they look a bit weird. Looks like I'm wearing sunglasses, but they're not. And um, right, are we ready? Or yeah, I think so. We're as ready as we could be. So yeah, over to you. <laughs> All righty. All right. Okay. Well, language coaches of the world, um, <laughs> tell me, I, I'm wondering, when, when, did you, when, did, when did you realize that you were becoming a coach instead of a teacher? Was this some sort of mysterious process that just maybe hasn't taken place yet completely, um, but maybe is in the process of happening? Because I can remember when I became a language coach, exactly the day in fact i can tell you that it was january the 9th 1989 yeah that long ago in madrid and um i was teaching business english uh in fact it was my first business english lesson ever one-to-one -one, first one ever and my student was the director general of a large bank in the Castellana with an office at the top of this building. Um, I'm already messing things up, I can see. And um, his name was Javier. He looked a bit like Antonio Banderas and sounded like him too. So I was already intimidated. 
And it all got a bit surreal when he introduced himself and said, uh, Mark, uh, welcome, please. Uh, I am very sorry, but uh, I, uh, today, today I am very constipated. And I was like, sorry? And he went, constipate today, very constipate. Yes, yes. And I said, um, right, well, I'm sorry, but we can reschedule if it's a problem. He said, no, 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 only small problem, no problem. Uh, please, you, you sit here, will not be problem. I thought, I sit here, it won't be, why won't it be a problem if I sit? I, th anyway, by the way, it's constipated, actually. Constipated, the ED ending. He went, ah, yes. I write it down, I write it down. So he had this very expensive notepad and a gold pen and he wrote down constipated. And I'm standing there thinking, what on earth? I'm supposed to be teaching business English. He's right, why is he writing this down? Um, I only, of course, found out later because my Spanish, I didn't have any Spanish then. Uh, of course, estoy constipado, if you speak Spanish, you'll know it means I have a cold. Um, and uh, th that's all he was telling me. And total miscommunication. And the lesson got worse from there. Um, nothing worked. I don't know if this has happened to you when you tried to teach one-to-one, -one, but nothing worked. I mean, I came to the conclusion that teaching one-to-one -one is actually impossible. Uh, you can't do group work, obviously. Pair work, asymmetric, doesn't really work. Reading comprehension, what the hell am I supposed to be doing while he's reading? Uh, listening comprehension? Why is he listening to, to a cassette then uh, instead of listening to me? So the whole thing unraveled. And my first lesson was shocking. I mean, it's just the worst lesson I've ever taught. And I realized then that if what you're doing isn't working, do something else, the old NLP mantra. So in my second lesson, I put, said, look, let's put the course book to one side. I took out a piece of paper, put it landscape, and I drew three lines on it. And then I wrote in some subjects. Can you see them? No, you can't see the middle one for some reason. That's a bit strange, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, my industry, customer needs, big banking stories, current trends, how all this affects my job. I said, Javier, please, Tell me about your work. Tell me about the industry you're in. His level of English, by the way, was A2+. Plus. He said, Ar, he's very interesting, but he's, uh, he's very complicated. I said, it's complicated, actually. He said, Ar, complicated, like constipated, same thing. I said, yeah, AD ending. The problem was, he wanted to be able to talk at a high level about things that were of interest to him, to be able to talk shop with people of similar status, even if only for a few minutes. He didn't want to fix appointments on the phone. His assistant did that. And anyway, he never fixed appointments in English on the phone because he didn't have the English for the meeting that he'd have after he'd fixed the appointment. So there wasn't any point in that. And so I realized then this was my first template. And although I didn't have a name for it, this was in fact my first coaching session, which I recorded and captured on cassette. Now, I just want to sort of think for a moment, um, teach, train or coach. What's the difference? Maybe if you want to put something in the chat on whether there's a, you know, what, what, what is it? We, of course, we do all three, but... Hmm. What is a coach? How are they different from a teacher or even a trainer? And have a little think about that. Maybe you're familiar with the origins of the words. Uh, a teacher, I don't know if you know, teacher actually comes from the Anglo-Saxon tekan, which means to demonstrate or show. So a teacher is somebody who shows you something. There it is, now you do it. That's a teacher. A trainer, a trainer comes, uh, anybody speak French? Maybe right to anybody guess what trainers from in the chat? Gabby, anybody got that? I'm just looking there. I don't, I don't see training, I mean, teaching. Not no, to worry. It's, yeah, it's from Latin and French. It's yeah. entraîné, which means to drag. A trainer is somebody who drags you through it, mm -hmm. uh, like poodles through hoops of fire. In certain <laughs> it's, 
It's a trait, and sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need a coaxer, a, 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 a motivator. But a coach, now you should know this if you're Hungarian. The word coach comes from? It comes from coach. It comes from transporting from one place to another. Um, yeah, it comes, coaches apparently were invented in Hungary in a, in a, in a place called coach. Coach. Coach, yeah, I got the pronunciation wrong, century. but you get the idea. Yeah, coach. And so a coach is a vehicle. It's something that takes you where you want to go, not on a mystery tour, but where you've paid the driver to take you. That's what a coach is. Peter Wilberg and Michael Lewis, back in 1990, in general, the language is provided by the teacher, but the content is provided by the student. And that's what I found with Javier, is that I wanted to help him deliver his content. So what we're talking about today, and I'm just gonna showcase as many ideas as I can in the time that I've got. So please interrupt me. If you're not happy with what I'm talking about, there'll be another idea along in a minute. So just boo me in an encouraging way and I'll move on. Okay, here we go. First of all, um, graphic language coaching really draws on two different approaches. One is uh, teaching unplugged or dog me, which you may have heard of some of you. Um, been around for years now, but sort of sign of the cross. Some people still a bit skeptical about it. And um, graphic coaching and facilitation is the other thing. Put those two together and you're moving towards a graphic language coaching methodology. Now, it's not the answer to all our prayers. It's just one thing you can do. But it's something that I think for some of your clients might give an extra dimension to your teaching, might help you to be more learner and learning centered. So if you're not familiar with dog me, I don't know how many people are, we won't do a show of hands, it'd take too long. Um, dog me language teaching, very briefly, one, the syllabus comes from the learner. Everything they want to talk about is already inside them. We don't need to foist materials onto them because they've already got it inside them. Uh, Scott Thornbury has a very nice way of describing this. He says, we uncover the learning syllabus. We don't cover a syllabus, we uncover it. It's conversation driven. It begins with conversation. Conversation is not the culmination of a lesson. It is the motivation for the lesson. It's the whole driving force behind it, but not just conversation. Conversation which has been scaffolded or supported by the coach. That's our job, to shore up their English and to feed in language as they need it. Third point, the coach's job is then to focus the learner's attention to get them to notice the language that they're both using, misusing and lacking, and really to then go into some detail with what they've produced. So it's an iterative process. And finally, the coach's job is to create a space of opportunity for the learner to speak. So to summarize, it's conversation driven, it's materials light, and it's emergent language. I've got my little dolphin there to show you it's emergent. Like a dolphin escaping from sea world. Okay, but how do you do that? Well, one way is through what I'm calling graphic facilitation and coaching for language learning. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it consists of, um, it, it, it comes from the, lang the, the world of business, the Grove Consultants, these are some of their examples, they're blurred for copyright reasons. Um, but the idea is that the facilitator using large templates, graphic pictorial templates, is going to shape and fashion the language of perhaps uh, a business meeting um, that's going on, uh, recording what's being said and perhaps guiding it. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the visuals at the top of the screen, you'll see there are things like project meetings, matrices, business environments, market overviews, and all of the language is recorded in a particular visual space. 
and there is an end product. There is an enduring record of the language that took place in the form of the picture that they carry away with them. Um, as uh, Christina Merkley uh, puts it, um, all these things are highly personalized, the content emerges, there's thinking space. Uh, very important that people have the time to create this record and to see the big picture, but at the same time in a very focused way. Don't just think it, ink it, says Christina Merkley. Um, turn your ideas and your language into pictures and text, but even if it is these days more electronic text. So we don't come to the session empty handed. Dogma, some people think, oh, that means turning up with nothing and seeing what the students come up with. No, it means we arrive with some graphic tools to shape that learner output. Now, here's an example of a graphic guide from The Grove. As you can see, it's a thing of beauty, uh, rather pretty. I've used this one myself, actually. Uh, it's very good for teaching project management, project map, uh, people completing the different stages, the milestones, the tasks, um, also uh, the goals and deliverables, the visions, uh, the key stakeholders, and so forth. This is quite a complicated map. They don't have to be that complicated. So I'm gonna show you one and work with one now in different forms, which is in fact exactly the one I used with Javier, the three lines on a page, but somewhat uh, updated. So here we go. First one. I'm noticing actually that this screen is not showing the edges, is it? One second. Uh, Sounds okay for me, Mark. Better. Is that better? Sorry? I can see the whole slide on there. Yeah. Good. It seems fine. It's okay. Is yeah, that okay? It's, co it's complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's better. That's right. I've just switched a different type of mode. Okay, so this one is I call industry snapshot. If you teach business English, um, this is a nice activity to use early on in the course. Uh, it's getting people to talk about the industry that they're in. Um, a little bit about the economic situation, the top three trends. These days, of course, the impact of COVID. Um, some basic details about the industry and key factors that are affecting it. Now, this is not something to hand out in a lesson, say, fill it in and now talk about it. And the reason for that is that people need time to plan their language. Mark Helgerson at the University of Columbia has done quite a bit of work on this and discovered that if people have a few seconds or even minutes to prepare before they have to produce language, they produce a much better quality of language. Not only more accurate and more fluent, but as Peter Skeen has pointed out, more complex, more advanced at a higher level. So a key part of working with graphics like this is to give people time to language plan. I talk them through these templates and then I let them go away in their own time and prepare them either as a one-to-one -one or as a group. And then they come back and then we fill them in together. And this was one for the automotive industry, quite detailed, as you can see, they came up with a lot. Obviously I've cleaned up this version. Now you can do this just with pieces of paper with handwriting. Uh, you can then scan it in and send it uh, to your coach if you're working online. Uh, you can produce it as a PowerPoint. Um, you can uh, tackle it in different ways. One of the ways I've used it is monologically, where learners actually present this information. But you can also use it dialogically, where they discuss it with you. So they start talking and I interrupt them and probe and ask for clarification. For example, um, tell me, uh, is it really true that the auto industry consumes half of, of world oil production? That seems astonishing. Down in the bottom left-hand corner. Yes, it's true. It's down 19% since 1999, but they're using half of world oil. Quite incredible. So you can have uh, conversations about this. 
they can present it, they can discuss it, they can do it as a team. You can, you can counsel learn it with a lower level group. Obviously they won't produce such detailed uh, information. Counsel learn it so that they speak, you help them, you record it, and then you do the next bit. So you do it bit by bit, gradually building up a recording of them speaking at a much higher level than they normally would be able to. Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you like this one. If you don't like it, just stay quiet about that. All right. Now, you don't have to do it like this. There are different ways of doing it. Oh, Richard Boyum likes it. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, is that going to disappear of its own accord or is it going to stay there? We've oh, got right. some Clear. sounds up here. Okay. Oh, right. Brilliant. Fine. Yeah. Well, there are different options, uh, hardware options. The one we've been looking at is just the sort of piece of paper or PowerPoint option, but you could do this as a wall chart and you could meta plan it um, where, for example, using post-its, they as a group put the information on a wall chart. And this makes the thing that I did with Javier on a little piece of paper with a pen, just so much more of an event. It becomes a lesson instead of something I just thought of because I didn't have a much lesson. So that's the trick. Um, now you can also see that um, you can do this on an online whiteboard like Miro. Are, are you familiar with Miro? Some of you nod. If you are, I think you might maybe are. Works very well with this kind of thing. Let me, since I'm now in this version, let's see if I can flip you over to here. Okay. And this is, this is the, e, I've done one for the ELT industry, by the way. If I had more time with you, I would have liked to put you into a breakout room and get you to do this one for ELT. I mean, did you know the market value of ELT industry is 9.6 billion at the moment? But look at this, by 2027, it's gonna be 27 billion. In just six years, it's going to triple. So it seems like we might be in the right industry. Now, if I just, the great thing about Miro is that you can zoom out. It's a bit like Prezi. And you can now see this is my activity in electronic format. Oh, I think you'll agree. It looks a bit sexier than the one you just saw. I hope you'll agree. Uh, I've put a flash bulb on it for talking about future directions. Great thing about Miro, if you don't know it, I'm not going to give you a tutorial on Miro now. I'm learning myself. But here you can produce obviously post its, little sticky notes, different colors. They're kind of cool. You write in them, it makes the text automatically the right size. Um, you can move things around. A uh, nice feature is that you've got an icon finder. So if I just put in the word, mm, uh, let's say, I don't what should we say, sales or something, then it will come up with a whole load of icons for sales and you can just drop those in, make them bigger, make them smaller. Um, and what you end up producing with a class, because you can share this with all the members of your group, is a complete constellation of information written in, uh, corrected, reformulated, upgraded, until eventually they have a finished product, which is that they are quite fluent in talking about the industry that they're in. Now I'm racing, I'm aware of that because I want to get through so much with you and I know racing's not a good idea, but I also want to cover lots of stuff. We've only covered one thing so far. So let's move on. Um, here's one, I'm still losing bits and pieces here. I don't know why, very strange. Mm, wasn't before, Never mind. Um, here's a more elaborate one that I did with the same group on the competitive landscape. If you're into marketing, it's Porter's Five Forces, uh, suppliers, competitors, customers, new entrants and substitutes. We don't need to worry about that. The basic idea is that, again, as a team, they fill out the information about their company and about their industry and about their competitors and about their suppliers. So a great deal of vocabulary emerges. And then there's a purpose. How are we managing? So they hold a meeting at which they discuss these things and then they have a series of action points for how they can manage the situation. Now, what sort of language emerges when you do this? Well, some of the language of meetings does, so it's a good opportunity to practice that. And also a lot of 
referential lexis, yeah? You know what I mean by that, content language. A lot of collocations, push up costs, negotiate terms, um, market forces and pressures, barriers to entry and exit, uh, target, serve, lose customers, price sensitivity. All of this language naturally emerges just in discussing something with which they are very familiar, their own market. Now you may say, yeah, Mark, but what if they don't have the English for it? Well, they frequently don't, but then you've found that they lack something for which they have an immediate need. That makes it incredibly memorable when you introduce the target language to them. Now, some people might want to pre-teach some of this vocabulary, but I wouldn't recommend it. I would say post-teach. Do not pre-teach. I don't know how many of you pre-teach. I was taught how to do this on the CELTA 150 years ago, whenever it was. Ye olde certificate in the teaching of tongues, it was called when I did it. Um, and we were told to pre-teach difficult vocabulary and not introduce more than six new items in a lesson. Crap. Do you know how long it would take to learn English if you only did six new items a lesson? I worked it out. I actually worked it out. 525 years if you only did six new items in a lesson, assuming you were getting two lessons a week. 525 years to learn English. I mean, it makes no sense. So with this, lots of language is going to emerge. It's going to emerge quite quickly. Um, and you can intervene to deal with it as it arises. The conversation you're having with them is both the process of learning and the product you are producing, namely this. Okay, let's move on to a completely different one, but it's still graphic facilitation. A um, bit less businessy. This one I call Lifeline. It's not a biographical timeline. Um, I'm not interested in when you went to school or you know when you got married. This is about meaningful life altering moments in your life. And if you look over on the left, you'll see it's about aspirations, achievements, turning points, lucky breaks, key people, and so on. This is a very good way of getting to know learners quite quickly, although you don't want to get to know them too well. You don't want to be too close. This is a general English version. So it's got this sort of pretty little visual in the middle there. Uh, to me, it looks a bit like a label on an Ayurvedic herbal supplement. Uh, so I would prefer the business English version, which is a little more, a little more conservative. By the way, just, we're just putting a backdrop on your worksheets makes them look so much nicer, I think. I don't know if you agree with me. It's just a little bit dying point. Oh, the Daleks are here. Um, so if you're going to do this, by the way, online with PowerPoint, I mean, get them to present it in a PowerPoint. Why not sex it up a bit more? I mean, why not? Let's have, let's have a GIF instead. And that's the same thing, moves around. Now, what, what, what you've given them is some text boxes down here on, on the left and some arrows so that they can complete this. And here's a version completed for me. I won't let you look at that for too long unless you want to get to know me too well. But you'll see that I've just put in some aspirations, some achievements, some turning points, professional, private, family. I haven't got any disasters or crises. I've got a setback. It was a very big setback. In fact, it was a crisis, but we don't want to make this too negative. So, of course, you can change the categories on the left if you wish and produce something quite different. Um, how do we feel about this one? Again, a few thumbs up if you like it. I'm kind of working on some materials in this area. So any feedback you can give me, I'll be very grateful for, however it is. Um, so a quick recap on the procedure. Okay, how to use graphic templates. One, pre-formulation. Okay, uh, do the needs analysis. Introduce them to some templates that might be helpful. Lock in some language or have them completely open. I prefer them to be completely open. And then give them time to prepare it, even days. If they haven't done it by your next lesson, don't say, oh, well, let's do it anyway. Say, let's wait until you're ready and then we'll do it. Now you can do that in collaboration with the coach if you want. You can help them complete the thing. But I think give them some time to think about it themselves first, even before they commit any text to the images. Okay, then we're ready for formulation. Present or discuss. 
and record. Always record. I don't know if you do this, but oh, you can always throw the recording away. Always record, always capture what they produce because that's the gold that is gonna help you to work with them. And then reformulation, of course, play back, reformulate. Or this is an old Earl Stevick technique I quite like. Model it yourself. Do what they did in a version slightly higher than they managed. Crashen's input plus one, you remember. Slightly higher than where they are and let them compare the two. So they have a copy of you describing that thing and them describing that thing and they notice the gaps. You're getting them to notice. This is a very involved learning process -y kind of a technique. Just one quick uh, caveat that you do have to be a bit careful. Um, yeah, these were, sorry, I should have said these were the things I, did. I mentioned earlier, language planning, Mark Helgerson, if you want the reference, complexity, Peter Skeen. Oh, and repetition. How much repetition do you do in your sessions? I mean, when I say repetition, I don't mean re getting them to repeat rote learning, of course, I mean, do you get them to do the same activity, the exact same activity again? Because you know, if they do, they're always better. There was research by Martin Bygate at Lancaster University. Some students did a task, then they went away, then they did it again. Did they get any teaching in the middle? Was it test, teach, test? No, they got nothing, but it was better every time. So if you do something a second time, they'll always be better. And though it's a bit dishonest, they'll think it was because of your teaching or coaching. And perhaps it was, but the fact is they'll improve anyway. Okay, there's a difference between getting people to talk about what I do and who I am. Be a bit careful about getting too close too soon. Um, graphic facilitation is about work and about talking about meetings and plans and so on. Who I am is more like graphic coaching. It's a talking about me. It's talking about what I want in life. And it's getting a little bit close to the nerve if you're not careful. So just think about that. I, I'm happy to do both. Psychological safety is what we're thinking about. John Powell, no relation. Um, why am I afraid to tell you who I am? I'm afraid to tell you who I am because if I tell you who I am, you may not like who I am and it's all that I've got. So people are kind of wary about getting too close too soon. But that said, you can sometimes use little techniques which get them to talk about themselves in a non-intrusive way. Here's one I've talked about before. So if you've seen it before, you can check your email for a minute. It's called Different Sides of Me and it's just a diamondogram. And this is how it works. Maybe you can think about this for yourself. Write down in some of the facets, wherever you like, five, six, 10 things about yourself. What, not adjectives, don't describe yourself to me. You know, I'm very conscientious. No, don't do that. Um, it's, this isn't an analysis. Nouns, what are you? Are you, this is me, a language coach. Are you a writer? Uh, I am a husband. I am a home renovator, uh, a Spanish speaker after a fashion, uh, a cat servant. Uh, I am a forest bather. If you don't know what that is, Google it. It's not running into the forest and plunging naked into lagoons. Um, it's much nicer than that. Uh, reluctant DIYer, yeah, because I have a house that's falling down. I'm a worrier because I have a house that's falling down. I'm a Shakespeare fan because I did English at university and I like to do Shakespeare speeches from time to time, but not today. Um, what else am I? Oh, I'm a techno agnostic. Today I'm turning technophobe, but normally I'm techno agnostic and occasionally I like them. Um, and finally, oh, I'm a recovering road rager because if you live in Mallorca where nobody uses their indicators, it's inevitable. So this is just a window into who I am. Uh, if you think that's a bit general, you could obviously do a business version of it and then ask them what that involves. You'd be surprised what comes up doing this. Um, it's really kind of interesting that because you're not putting pressure on them to be anything, because you model it first by sharing who you are with them, so they're more likely to share who they are with you. This is a general English activity, a business English activity, any kind of 
research activity. Another quick one, social networks, your family, your friends, your work. I like to make these things look 3D. You could just have concentric circles if you wanted. I like depth in my worksheets. I don't know if you agree with me, but it, it just gives them a sense of purpose and it looks like it's something slightly more meaningful than just a couple of circles on a piece of paper. Uh, family, uh, you simply put the people in on your family sociogram. You can just draw them in if you want, or uh, you'll notice I've got some people down in the bottom left-hand corner. You can just copy and paste those. And then put some initials in for them as well. So we put them in for work, we put them in for friends. Who are they? Let's put some uh, indication of how much time I spend with them if we want a bit of life work balance. And then let's put some initials in. Who is BA? That's my wife, that's Begonia Arswaga. JP is Joan Pott, that's my mother, who lives in the Netherlands. So you can see already, it's kind of a little insight into who's who. And you simply ask them, who is JP? Tell me about, is it a man or a woman? Oh, it's your mother, oh right, okay. Uh, so she has the same name as you. No, she has a Dutch name because she's married again. All right, okay. You can get them to introduce people to you. Introduce me to this person at work. Uh, if you work with somebody from your family, you can show that. If you have a work team, you can show that. Uh, if somebody from work is also a friend or uh, friends in a group, and you can see how this, this sort of networking process is, is much more involving than just a, you know, tell me about your family draw a family tree, uh, what on earth for, you know, or a company organogram. Um, it, it's just a little more involved than that. I hope you like that one. I'm, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're, are we okay till when, yeah. seven? I just wanted to say, yeah, we're, we're kind of halfway. Well, I'm halfway through my slides because okay. I've galloped. Because I saw, I saw immediately that I was just going to, by the way, can you just put, this is be helpful to me now. Um, feedback. We're halfway through, we're halfway through my stuff. So actually I'm not behind schedule. That's a, an achievement in itself. But I know I'm racing and I don't really want to, but I do want to cover things and I want you to be able to look at them. You'll get a whole PDF of this, by the way, at the end, all the slides. And if you want some, uh, if you want some PowerPoints of some of them, because they're interactive, then you're welcome to have those. I'll send them to you. Okay. Feedback, please. Could yeah, you give me okay. some feed, quick feedback in the chat box? So, okay. okay. Give me a score from nine to 10. <laughs> <laughs> Always limit feedback. Okay. <laughs> Never, never say one to ten because Ooh, I mean you could give me 13. one and then I'm burst into tears. So <laughs> doesn't work anyway. Actually, nine to ten. <laughs> I did that in Germany once, and somebody gave me nine point six five. Oh, that's nice. Okay, you. He said, got "Well, if the baseline is nine, then this means that nine point six five would be the equivalent of six and a half out of ten." I'm afraid. And I was like, "Oh, bloody hell!" And I thought I'd got him, but I hadn't. So there you go. Um, okay, so lots of, lots of positive feedback. Give me 10, some feedback. 11s, 12s, so lot, lots of that. All and right, I, I uh, okay. Obviously, obviously some friends and family came in. That was fortunate. <laughs> it's probably JP, BA and VB doing that. Um, <laughs> and the yeah. pace is good too, okay? Is the pace okay? Because yes. I feel like I'm galloping. No, and I'm fine. not using any of my notes and I'm flying by the seat of my pants. But it's quite fun, actually. I'm beginning to enjoy it more. Um, OK, uh, there were some others that I wanted to go through. I, I will go through them. What the hell? I will do it. Here we go. Um, debating change at work. Force field analysis. Proposed change goes in the middle. One that they're really facing. And then pros on the left, cons on the right and a score out of five for each. Is it a strong reason to do it? Is it a strong reason not to do it? Add up the scores, come to a conclusion. This is a very quick graphic way of getting people to debate, argue, agree, disagree, give opinions and come to a decision. You don't need a course book, you don't need a role play, you just need a real change they're facing at work and a graphic, done. Okay, this is some of the language that might come up, but we're not gonna pre-teach that. We're gonna see what they come up with. And then we might feed some of this in. A SWOT analysis, you're familiar with those, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Is it a personal SWOT or is it an organizational SWOT? Keep it short. This is a short activity, just a few things. I'll give it some direction. 
Uh, to what extent are your strengths compensating for your weaknesses? To what extent can you convert those weaknesses into strengths? How do you leverage opportunities? How do you counter threats and so on? Actually, this is, you'd be surprised the amount of language and content that will come out of something as simple as that. And if it doesn't, well, you just think, okay, put that to one side, move on with something else. I think that's the responsiveness that's required of a language coach as opposed to a language teacher. Okay, let's move on. Oh, this one's um, a bit more, bit more sophisticated. This is an Ansoft matrix. This is um, thinking about products, new market, existing product, new product, ex uh, old market, etc. Put your group into four. Each person in the group um, tackles one of the four quadrants and has to defend this strategy. We should be innovating. We should be doing diversification. We should have new products. Another one's going, no, no, we should be selling more of our old products, market penetration. This is sometimes called red ocean and blue ocean strategy, if you're familiar with that business book. And they argue it out. Uh, you have one person chairing it. Um, you've introduced some chairing language before this. And if you want to see a bit, I think I have a bit lined up here somewhere, do I? Oh, I did have, let me just see. Wait a minute. Oh, God. Uh, 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 I can't see for this thing. What's going on? How do I close this one? Let me see. That's not going to close everything, is it? No. Good. All right, let's try it through the hyperlink. Oh, fingers crossed. Oh, there you go. Can you see that? Padlet, also a useful tool, which you probably use. Uh, on the left, functions, opening, bringing in, especially linking, uh, linking people's ideas in a meeting. Oh, that was a good idea. And if we combine it with Jennifer's idea, I think it will be even better. So what they do here is they group this information according to the function, because obviously these move around on the screen. It's a, it's a pin board. Uh, and with a time limit, maybe in teams, they try to connect these up. OK. And once you've done that, you go back to your meeting, and this is the fluency activity that follows on from it. Okay. Um, I'm going to. Nem változott semmit az űrge. Nem Sorry. Can I ask you to unmute, please? Or mute yourself. Sorry. Of course. Okay, we've got it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, to close, I want to. I'm going to show you because I feel it's. Been, I feel that there's a danger with trying to go so fast and show a wide range of things that you're, it's a bit bitty. So I'm going to try and pull it together now and show you two case studies uh, using different templates for a purpose. And the first one is. Let's skip on from that. The first one is this. This was a learner that I was working with just last year. Um, Nice guy, uh, won't give too much information about him just in case he ever watches this. Um, yeah, have to be careful about things like that if it's going on YouTube. Um, he worked for a sort of sports media company. Um, he had a fantastic job. Uh, he just left a very good job to take it. Then COVID came along and he uh, was basically made redundant through right sizing as they call it. Well, it wasn't right for him, but it was right sizing. So he was basically still working in his old job, but looking for a job. And uh, mid-level, B2, B1 plus for accuracy, I would say, but fluency, B2. And this is what we decided to do. I decided I'd do three things with him. Some executive coaching, actually stepping into coaching. Not language, but it would lead to the language. Interviewing skills, obviously, because he was going to have to look for a job. He was extremely worried about the financial situation and networking skills as well. So there were, this were the three things we were looking at. So for the executive coaching, we looked at a template called Professional Crossroads, which is produced by The Grove. I can't show you the original because that would be copyright, but I did pay for it. But the version I'm going to show you is like a copy that I made. Uh, interviewing skills, we did three things. The industry snapshot that I showed you earlier, uh, and two other things, career track and star moment. And then we did a reverse role simulation as the final activity. 
And that, as you probably know, a reverse role simulation involves learners writing questions they would expect to be asked in the situation, in this case, an interview. Mm -hmm. Could be a negotiation, could be an appraisal, but in this case, it would be a job interview, probably online. So you've got the final fluency activity and all the things building up to it. I'm not going to talk about networking skills today, but I will talk about these other things. So first of all, we did a little bit of coaching, personal crossroads. Where are you? What's calling you? Who's involved? What are the uncertainties? What's urgent that you've got to get done? And what has brought you here? What has, what in your past, in your career, in your qualifications, what's got you where you are? And, uh, Hmm. We filled that in. You don't need to read it through, but you can see that he was making connections. And we established that he obviously would need some help with interview skills. Okay, so we used um, a template called Career Track, which has got a resume section, current role and responsibilities, and how these make me a perfect fit for the role. So information here at the top uh, around his past career, a kind of timeline, here about his current role and responsibilities and how these make him a perfect fit for the role, sort of three steps. So he worked on these, but again, we discovered that this worksheet really was too inflexible. The problem sometimes with templates is that they're kind of frozen and you want to unfreeze them, maybe by using um, Metaplan, you know, moving stickies and labels around on a wall rather than having a fixed poster like this. Mm -hmm. So even though the language that came up was, was pretty good, it was the sort of thing he wanted. I graduated, I was promoted, I was put in charge of, I contributed to, I'm responsible for, blah, blah, blah. I've now gained sufficient experience. I believe I have a proven track record in, et cetera, et cetera. The language was good, but we wanted a bit more flexibility. So again, we went to Myro. And um, when we went to Miro, this is what we ended up with. Um, I won't actually take you to the website now, but this is, as you can see, in Miro format. We have the career track. We put in sticky, sticky notes instead of using. Can I actually go to it? I don't know. No, that thing's in the way. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Okay, we'll just stick with this one. Um, so he built up his, his resume, the past, and his current role, the present, and how that fits in for the job. But then we discovered, no, wait a minute, there's something missing here. Perhaps you found this yourselves. In job interviews, a lot of the time, they don't ask you questions. They ask you for examples. They say things like, tell me about a time when you took a decision without much support from senior management and it worked out. Tell me about that. Tell me about a time when you had a hunch and it turned out to be the right hunch. Tell me about that. They ask you these kind of case study type questions. So what we worked out was there must be a format for these. And the format that we looked at is a star moment. What was the situation? What was the task? What was your brief? How did you do it? And how successful was it? That's a kind of format for talking about something you did well at work, especially if you then add in takeaways, what I learned from it, and how that will help me in a post at your company. So we did this for a while and it worked quite well. Um, but we discovered that it was a bit report-like. He was giving a report on himself. You know, I did this and there was a problem with that and they tasked me with this and I had a team of so-and-so and it worked quite well. But I said, how about, we, how about we tell this as a story instead and make it like a little movie? Maybe job interviews are an opportunity to actually tell stories about yourself and your work that will make you an attractive proposition to the employer that you're facing. So this was how it worked out as a little movie sketch. 
Act one, the setup. What was the problem, the project, the challenge? Act two, the call to action. What was my brief? Act three, the drama unfolds. How did I handle it? Act four, the end. How successful was I? And so by working through storytelling around his achievements, rather than just talking about his achievements, and we then pegged, as I showed you just a minute ago, we then pegged those um, achievements to his timeline. Let's see if I can get this to work this time. No, it's not doing it, how bizarre. Ah, wait a minute, I know why. It's because I went out of full screen. Yeah, brilliant, great. Okay. Here's a second case study, a small closed group, B1 plus. They wanted problem solving meetings and presentations, standard stuff. So we used three templates to guide that. And then they had a series of video conferences, two meetings and a presentation. Step one, defining the problem. Now I could have just given them roll cards, an agenda, um, but I didn't. Instead, I gave them a template. And the first template looked like this. What is the problem? Five whys, common problem solving tool. Why is this happening? And why is this happening? And why is this happening? And you trace it back as far as you can until you get to the root cause of the problem. And you write that down. Now let's break the problem down into parts and write them in. And now let's see if we can redefine the problem. Can we refine it? Maybe something more accurate than our original definition of the problem. So I gave them this worksheet. They went away. I said, have a look at it. You can write on it if you want. I've got plenty more, but you don't have to write on it. I just want you to think about it because when you come together, this is the role play. You're going to have an agenda, which is a welcome definition of the problem. Remember, it's a real problem that they're facing. Five whys, root cause, break it down, up to close. I gave them some rules as well because I like doing that. don't know if you do that in meetings, but I always like to give them some rules for the meeting to coax them into certain language use that I want them to practice. So the rules here, you can see on the right. And then what they had was they would have, had they been in a classroom, had a poster on the wall with that template that I just showed you. But because it was online, we did it in Myra. And so they had the template there and they had the meeting, they completed it and they came up with a redefinition of the problem. It changes the whole language of a meeting, by the way, if you have them completing a visual as they speak. It slows it down, gives them more time to think, uh, makes the whole thing much more deliberate. The output is a good deal better than if they're just talking to each other. So then the second template was to take that redefined problem and flip it. Instead of thinking how we can make the problem better, think about how we can make it worse. Oh, how does that, what does that tell us about how we can make it better? Because sometimes if you think about making it worse and you reverse it, you'll have found a way to make it better. How could we get fewer customers? Well, we could stop replying to um, inquiries. That would help. Yeah, sure. Uh, we could um, put our prices up. That'd be good. Yeah, that would get us fewer customers, right? And so they held a little silly meeting on how to make things worse. And then have a look at that. Are there any clues in there as to things you could do to make it better? And then they brainstormed ideas from the light bulbs. And the ideas were evaluated for their desirability, feasibility, viability. So it's quite involved. It looks like a very simple worksheet, but there's a massive language here. And again, they were given this worksheet and then they came back and then they got the roll card and then they got the rules. And then they held the meeting and they came up with a solution to the problem. And finally, they presented it. Back to journeys. You may have noticed that the journey metaphor is quite a recurrent one in graphic visualization. And it's quite an important one in coaching as well. You know, where are you going? Are you sure that's where you're going? 
Where have you been? Where have you come from? How long did it take you to get here? How did you get here? How will how, we, how you got here help you get there? What are the next steps you need to take? What alternatives do you have? These are coaching questions, journeys. And this is the journey of the presentation that they gave from an ABCD opening. Are we familiar with ABCD openings? Quick poll. Attention. Benefit. Mm -hmm. Credibility. Direction. Get your audience's attention. Tell them what they'll get out of the presentation. Show them why you're the right person to be telling them and then give the direction of your presentation. It's a neat template for beginning a presentation. A, B, C, D, attention, benefit, credibility, direction. Then uh, state the problem over here. Uh, identify the root of the problem, all the things they did in the meeting. Uh, itemize the different options you had, the key three. Evaluate, eliminate, and make your final recommendation. And then end. What I call, uh, I don't know if anybody else does, a SWOT ending, which is a summary, some words of wisdom, call to action, and thank. Works quite well. The door in, the door out, and a journey between the two. Almost brought us to the end of the presentation today. I feel I've galloped a bit, but this was my first ever Zoom presentation and I can't finish it without doing my own SWOT ending, of course. So I'll have to do that. First of all, a summary. The need to teach needs to be replaced with the te teaching to need. Uh, teach to their need. Learner-centered, yes, we're all learner-centered these days. I mean, you know, a few people might not be. Um, oh, I'm teacher-centered. Um, but generally speaking, people are learner-centered. Learning-centered um, is, a, is a nicer idea. Let the process of the lesson be what we concentrate on. Pre-teaching, no, let's move towards post-teaching. Let's not teach things just in case. Oh, here are some useful expressions for interrupting just in case you need them. No, no, wait for them to interrupt. Now teach them just in time because they'll be a lot more memorable. Target language, no, emergent language. The language which emerges becomes the target. We don't have a target first. First of all, we need to know where our target is. Otherwise, we'll be shooting in the wrong direction. And we don't go from process to product. The product is the process. The whole lesson is a needs analysis and a fluency practice and a final product, a recorded meeting, telephone message, presentation, whatever it was they wanted to practice. So that was your summary. Words of wisdom. It's not about the templates. It's not about the templates I just showed you. They're just my templates. You might not like them. You might be able to do better ones. Maybe you already are. In one-to-one -one and small group teaching, however specialized, the technical repertoire of the teacher is more important than the materials repertoire. It's not, you don't want these templates to become yet more materials that clog up your lesson. Be free, be free to use them in a way that will, Andrea Buza sent me a little heart message, I see there, Buja. How do you pronounce that, Nick? I should know, because I know her, and I can't pronounce her name. Hello, Andrea. Nice to see you after so long. <laughs> okay. And now a call to action. Graphic templates. We help people see what they mean. When you add image to text, to voice, you create a rich, immersive language experience for the learner, where speaking is not the culmination of the lesson, the destination of the lesson. It's the journey of the lesson. It's the motivation of the lesson. It's everything.
Thank you very much. Wow. I think that silence says it all. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't and you're still here, thanks for sticking with it till the end to make sure. And, uh, and anyway, it's over now, so relax. Um, I have on your PDFs put in some resources. As I've said, you, you can have the whole slideshow because we did have to go very, very quickly. Um, mm. and, uh, so you've got that. Um, so for information about free PowerPoint templates, backgrounds, slides, and so on, because you might be thinking, oh my God, I don't want to design all that stuff. Well, you don't have to. Um, there's free stuff out there and icons as well. If you're interested in graphic facilitation, these are some of the best books, I think, on the subject. If you want to do some training in it, this is The Grove I spoke about. The Grove is to graphic facilitation what Olympus was to the Greek gods. It's the home of facilitation. And they will do training courses if you want, uh, some of them online. A uh, quick shout out about Christina Merkley because she was my trainer when I did a course in this many years ago. Um, absolutely great course, fantastic. You can become a fully certified visual coach should you wish to with Christina. And uh, Work Visible as a company I just found recently offering online courses, quite reasonably priced, basic and advanced. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very Thank much, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting it's a lot wonderful. of Wonderful. Well, great. Thanks um, ever so much. Yes, please, please keep them coming. There will be more soon. Hey. Uh, Thanks, Mark. It was great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Great. You're very welcome. I hope you took something good from it. If, if anyone Peter, would like to Peter, hear. Peter Stang, there he is, mate. I haven't seen oh. you for I don't know how long. Barcelona, um, Barcelona in when was it? 2008 or something uh, like that? No, seven. Uh, Eight, seven. Yeah, 2007. Well done. What a memory. <laughs> there you go. I, I well never done. forget faces. You see. <laughs> Crow, nice to see you. If nice anyone, to see you right. If Kayla, anyone. Hello, Michaela. If anyone would like to share what their biggest takeaways from today. I mean, for me, it was like a BE masterclass with a coaching twist in a way. So if is there any. Yeah, I felt it was a bit like rapid. My own feedback wouldn't be good, but um, I, I desperately wanted to cover a lot of stuff. And I know that you can watch this again so that if it was too fast, it doesn't really matter. Rather than go in a very gracious way with breakout rooms and only cover a quarter of what we did, and I'd like to have covered even more. But if you're interested, I'm exploring this area a bit more. So if you'd like to find out more about um, just language coaching with visuals and things, um, or just business English in general, get in touch. Um, yeah. You can yeah. contact me whenever you want at markdavidpowell at yahoo.com. There we are. Shall we put Quick plug. <laughs> Weddings, bar mitzvahs, dances, <laughs> you name it, I'll do it. Um, um, Gabrielle, it's Bettina here. I would just say one takeaway is just that with all of us coming out of COVID, yeah. it's it's so amazing to get out of the verbal and all of us in large companies who are dealing with, and then teams, and then, you know, and now we're trying to figure out how to work uh, effectively as ritual teams, especially in the last 18 months. The yep. visual is so satisfying. And um, we rolled out a visual graphic um, needs assessment tool, which is sort of a mind mapping. And that's been really successful. So it was inspiring to see everything you've developed. Absolutely. Thank you. It, yeah. I, I, th I think that's spot on because uh, that that's what um, clients, I mean, globally are recognizing that there's there's so much more universal connection through visual elements and it, it can build trust and you know rapport much faster than if you're trying to push something verbally because it's just there you can relate to it and you can add whatever you want and you can you can build your language and anything that you want to work yeah. with the skills etc through them yeah so totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. any, any other takeaways or anything that anyone would like? Uh, well, th thanks, Mark. It was great. It's, Marjorie. Sorry, Carol, is that Marjorie? Hi. It's been ages. I, uh, yeah, it's been I, I feel ages. like presenting in a wardrobe on Zoom. It's like <laughs> I'm in a wardrobe with the door yeah. shut, but I can just see yeah. a gap through the width, through the door, yeah. and, and there are people, and it, oh, gosh, yeah. it's so yeah. different from live. Yeah. 
Oh, I know. Anyway, I'll get used to um, it. Go um, easy on me. It was my just, first one. I'm a virgin like, with this. <laughs> um, something I've done with visual things for a long time is the, the Dubliner song, The Sick Note. Oh. I play it for people while we work on it a bit. And then they have to create a poster about what happened. Ah. And it is fantastic. It's especially good with engineers. Right. Because so that's them doing the pictures thing. after the text. And they yeah. yes, but it's a very complicated text with the whole thing with the bucket going right. up and down and the bricks right. and so right. it gives them lots of of material to work with and yeah. to talk about processes. It's fun. Mm -hmm. If you can use it. <laughs> good to see you. Uh -huh. Good to see I you too. It's been a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. too long. I'm out of circulation here in my bunker as you can see. <laughs> There's some 30 feet here. underground in the rocks. Uh, I think okay. Carolyn wanted to say something. Ah. Well, it gives the learner an absolute um, great example of how to work and not be so caught up in grammar, vocabulary. Yeah. So it, it, it's working at two levels. It gets them into their world, but it also gives them skills for taking that into their real world, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, because the classroom shouldn't be, most of the time, a replication of reality. You know, when you're, you're yeah. practicing tennis, you don't just play tennis. Yeah. You, you practice one shot over and over again, and you make a mess of it, and that's fine, because you're practicing. And the, the classroom is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a gymnasium, it's a training ground. Uh, it's okay to mess up here because we're working towards it being good when you really need it in your real job when you go mm -hmm. back. And um, very often uh, activities like these, which are quite light on material, but pretty heavy on language output, very output heavy. Um, I find that those are more motivating than that, you know, listen to the audio uh, recording of a meeting, and fill in yeah. the gaps and now organize the phrases and now practice with a partner and, you know, especially online that's as dead as dead somehow yeah uh, caroline i agree with you and mark I, I was thinking that um it's relaxing to see that visual yeah it, it takes you out of, of your it takes yeah. you out of your day-to-day -day. if you're in the middle of a meeting like a busy day yeah. and then you have this time with your coach that's really different visually it can inspire yeah, you so. remotivate you yeah I hope so. And I mean, some people have said to me with some of them, oh, but Mark, that's just, I mean, it's just a pretty picture. You could have just scribbled that on a piece of paper. You didn't have to do all that work. And I say, well, yeah, if I'd scribbled it on a piece of paper, it would look like I scribbled it on a piece of paper. It would look like I didn't really care about it. It's not really a thing. And you make it a thing when you invest some time and its color and its shape. And it becomes a conceptual place, which is scribble on a piece of paper simply wouldn't be like the diamond one, for example, which is nothing. I mean, it's just nothing. It's just empty space with a little diamond thing on it. You might say, well, what's the point of that? Well, it's been one of my most successful lessons, <laughs> frankly. I don't know if that says something about my lessons, but I've written umpteen course books and I've had more success with that than anything I've ever done out of one of my course books. <laughs> Shouldn't probably say that, but I can now that I'm 60 and semi-retired. Um, that was so, a takeaway when you said that you put depth into them and it's yeah. not just drawing a circle. And so using that lens with all of the graphics as they went. Yeah, because, because people are multidimensional and, and that sort of capitalizes on that. We have different, I mean, well, not everybody is, of course. I mean, you know, some people are one dimensional. We all know who they are, but they're very <laughs> difficult to spot, aren't they? Because you can only see them from certain angles. Uh, and, but most of us have multi dimensions to us, and uh, that capitalizes on that. I hope. Yeah. Anyway, I'm glad you enjoyed those. Yeah, we are, we are getting messages. If we stop screen sharing, then we can actually see each other. Yeah, yeah. let's me stop the screen right. share. I don't know why we're still on it, really. I was just trying to get. <laughs> That's yeah. much oh, better. Oh, yeah. right. Oh, okay. Oh. Can't you tell you've got some clown who doesn't know what he's doing on a bloody quiet. Zoom site? I teach on Zoom all the time, but I've never presented on Zoom, and now I can see <laughs> why. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to have to go away and learn how to do this. I've got a presentation again in three weeks' time, I think. Oh, maybe yeah. they don't want me anymore after, uh, after I've shown my ineptitude. Um, I'm going to have to learn to be a much more techie, savvy person. It's isn't it interesting, the things that work face-to-face -face that don't work in Zoom, and vice versa, of course. Mm. 
We've got some hands up here. I think some hands up from Paul. Andrea Paul, and then Paul. Okay. Paul's got his hand up. Yeah, but uh, Andrea was first, so we'll go. Oh, with sorry. That. I'll, okay. let you, I'll let Paul you. I'll let you be the arbiter then. Okay. I'll let you do it. Okay. Yeah. Let's be brief. Okay, Andrea. Andrea. If that's me. Yeah. Is that me? Yeah. I'm yep. sorry. I just cannot turn the camera on. I've tried everything, but I just uh, I find no means. Uh, okay. I met uh, Mark Powell. I don't know how many years ago. Uh, last oh, time yeah. I met I met him, it was 2011. Uh, hard to say. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Uh, but you were here in Budapest, and we used a couple of uh, similar slides that you just presented here. Yeah. And now I'm not into language coaching anymore, anymore, but I'm into organization development and coaching. All right. And just you won't believe, but I'm still using your ideas and many of the slides and many of the prompts that you presented. And oh. it's just just amazing. And earning a lot more money. Well, well done. <laughs> Let me know how you do it. Uh, yes, we'd all like to convert. A, pr to a private I'm conversation. A private conversation. <laughs> we need to launch that. <laughs> Yeah, but indeed. So anyhow, uh, you just inspired me so much uh, with, the, with the ideas uh, and I got the, um, the inspiration again and I'm, 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 I'm just loving it. I'm not so, so help. I'm so, um, you know, I'm not into English anymore. You can see my own my language because I'm doing Hungarian uh, most of the time. But uh, well, it's still really, lovely but, to hear. It's still lovely to hear your voice. Andrea. But 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 what you do in language coaching is just it can be converted into coaching and executive coaching. That's what I, I wanted to. Uh, that's what I wanted to tell you, and that's what I'm, my message. Uh, would I think like so. To be. And, and if you think about it, what's a needs analysis? Uh, I mean, it can be just a form that they fill in, and then you sort of tick boxes. But it can be done as a coaching session because it is a coaching exactly. session, really. Exactly. Exactly. And um, a kind of coaching orientation. In fact, I've, I've worked with people on presentation skills where we start with that. We start with coaching before we look at language, because just launching straight into language, having found out nothing really about them that they need to do presentations yeah. is not, not good. Um, so coaching That's training is very well worthwhile for us. I don't, I don't think we need lots of qualifications, but perhaps need one something. Uh, I'm sure an inspiration and I, 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 an idea that gets you thinking. That's right. Yeah. And also for the presentation, because the, for the presentation course that you also did in Hungary, yeah. I'm kind of basing my, uh, my presentation course in Hungarian to those ideas, in, also in, involving Shakespeare and Exiparian and so, and so on and so forth. Shakespeare, yes. I, I don't know whether you remember. Yeah, another that. time, we'll have some time for yeah, Shakespeare. That, that's, that's I haven't done any Shakespeare travel. for a while, but I must time, time travel. Do it again. Yes, yeah. my my Romans and countrymen and so on. <laughs> and I still see you yeah. approaching, but I'm I'm so happy I'm so happy that uh, I could be here in this session again. Thank you very much, pa Mark. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. Okay, Paul. Yeah, Paul. Paul is jumping so, out. Hi, hi. Thank you. I, hi, Paul. You got in there in the end. Hi, hi. Absolutely fascinating. And really, I wanted to bridge from what Andrea just said. So this is actually going beyond the, the teaching or even the coaching of language. When you gave this example of the step of the um, of the star process, mm. it's actually teaching people processes and teaching people structures and ways of thinking about things. Yeah. Not yeah. only how to talk about them, but often they need to know how to think about them in yes. order to talk about them. I do yeah. a lot of I do a lot of work with um, academics writing grant proposals because they want to have the language and the rhetoric of of, of, of writing funding applications. Sure. But actually, I find that, that most of them don't really know how to conceptualize their, 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 their idea, their problem, their impact, their dissemination, their sustainability. And all of mm -hmm. these things, I kind of have to teach them as I'm going through the language. And I think yeah. now I'm really, really inspired almost to turn every single one of my grant writing mini workshops into a sort of a graphic facilitation tool, because I think there's so much. Uh, yeah, you could in indeed that. present a course uh, and the syllabus of it kind of in that way. Uh, I mean, even using the journey metaphor, because, of course, a presentation is a journey, uh, at least when it's done a bit less recklessly than I did it today. Uh, you go at a reasonable speed. And if you're going to change direction, you indicate to avoid crashes. Occasionally you take a detour. You might want to hit the accelerator. I seem to be on the accelerator all the time today, but you want the brakes as well sometimes. And I mean, it is a journey with a destination 
and the objective is not to get there as quickly as possible, but to get there in a timely fashion and so on. So the whole journey metaphor could be a visual way of presenting what you do. Yeah, from A, B, C, D opening to SWOT ending and then looking at rhetorical devices and things which we didn't have time to talk about today. But you're right, they can be graphically represented. And, but also the, the content and the, the, pro the processes and the structures yeah, the ways of thinking the I do like the star it. moment thing. It's, it's, there are two star moments in management. There's Nancy <laughs> Duarte's star moment. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with Nancy Duarte. Um, she's a presentations trainer and designer. Her star moment is something they'll always remember. Can you get one of those into your presentation? It might be a gimmick or it might be something you say or do, but it's a, something they'll always remember. But this one, uh, the interview one, uh, situation, task, action, result. Uh, it works really well for telling a story about something you did at work. And even when they ask you an ordinary question, like, you know, would you say you are, um, would you say you are a creative person? I mean, that's a stupid question. What are you supposed to say? You know, well, I yeah, I think I'm, I am quite, no, you don't say anything about that. Mm -hmm. You say, well, a few years ago, I was doing this and the boss came to me and said, could you try this? And I thought, oh God, I've never done that before. I'm not sure, but then I thought this opportunity may not come again. So I said, sure, no problem. Famous last words. Anyway, long story short, now you're telling a story. Isn't that better than saying, well, I think I am a creative person. Never do that in an interview. Never describe yourself. Give an example, let them draw their own conclusions. Um, that's what I would say. Oh, demonstrate. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Ricardo, I know you're next. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Gabriella, for this amazing opportunity. I'm also a big fan of Mark, uh, so glad to see some familiar faces here as well. And I'm going to bridge a bit of what Paul uh, just mentioned, which has to do with two points. First, thanks a lot for encouraging all of us here to go and move towards uh, graphic facilitation. Whenever I work with materials, I see like, how is it worth to spend all my energy to this? But definitely uh, this moves to the second point, which is you presented today in one hour, uh, a load of absolutely relevant resources and ideas that can help us going, uh, moving on with our uh, coaching uh, uh, intentions and our, our work as a coach. and. Thanks as well for inviting the very beginning of the session, uh, the moment that we shifted from uh, language teaching to, to something a bit uh, beyond that, which I believe it is crucial. Thank you very much once again, Mark. Very welcome. Very welcome, Ricardo. Very welcome. Yeah, it's a mind shift from one to the other, but of course we do a bit of each. I mean, even if you're a coach, you're gonna do some teaching from time to time, there will be, there is still a place for saying, no, it works like this. That's not how it works. You, the language doesn't go like that. You know, I mean, there's a place for that. There's a place for correction, but not much. You know, I met Stephen Krashen once at, uh, not name dropping, I was just at a conference and he happened to be there in the exhibition area. And I approached him as I always do when I see famous people, I don't run away. I go and talk to them, but I had a word with him. You know that Stephen Krashen, the acquisition theory guy, uh, is famous for sort of not being very keen on correction. And I, and I said, well, I kind of agree with you because if we, if correction worked, we'd need to do more of it, surely. We don't do enough in the lesson. We only do about sort of maybe 10 corrections in a lesson. Well, that can't be enough, can it really? So why bother doing any? And he said, you're right, you're right. I said, but what should we do instead of correction? And I thought he'd say something like reformulation, which is what we talked about a bit today, not much, but a little bit. He didn't. He said, I said, what should we do instead of correction? And he said, move on, move on, do something else. If it's an important mistake, the opportunity, I'm doing a terrible ham American accent, but this is how he sounded. The opportunity will present itself again. Wait for that. Don't rush in now. It won't work. They are getting it wrong because they're not ready to get it right. Do something else. And I thought, yeah, why waste time going back to repair something when we could just go on and do something new that we won't be able to do if we go back and do the repair job? So hell, 
Correction. Okay. <laughs> Tim, I know Tim wants to ask because he's raised his hand. Tim. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. Tim, where are you? Should be there. Are oh, you guys Somewhere on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Should be on the screen. I can't. Yeah, see. just uh, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned oh, the, you mentioned the recordings that you say are essential. Yeah. Uh, during the session, could you give us just a quick comparison between what a one-to-one -one session would look like compared to a small group? How you record? Well, in one, you, and, one what, and what you do with the recording afterwards? Yeah. Well, in one-to-one, -one, I record nearly everything um, mm -hmm. because I, I'll make a note of when it's useful and when it isn't, so that I can ditch. The stuff I don't want later. Obviously, I'm not going to listen to it all again. Um, but I record nearly anything because you don't know when something's going to come up that could be useful. And often you think, "Damn, I wish I'd recorded that now. That was good." And the, bin, the, the thing he did is the task was terrible, and I can't play that back to him. It'll be demoralizing, you know. So um, I record nearly everything. Try to capture the language that they produce. With a group, it's more difficult. Now you can't really do that. Um, but I do want to regularly get them to do an activity again. And I tell them that we'll do it again. Because think about this, the first time you do something, it's never very good, is it? I mean, if I did this talk again, I like to think I'd do it better. Um, and then probably better again. And then after a certain point, you get worse. If you do lots of presentations of the same thing, you get worse because you get bored and you get complacent and it starts going downhill. Um, but if you ever go to a good presentation, you know, one of these platform TED speakers, and you think, wow, that was just great. I can promise you this. They gave that presentation before. They've said those words before. That's why they sounded so good. If they'd never said them before, it wouldn't be that good. You always do it better as a follow-up um, because now you know how to do it. You know that you did it once, you saw the potholes, the things that went wrong, so now you can change. So if you don't give them the chance to do the exact same task again, not a similar task. I used to do similar ones because I thought, oh, they'll be bored, they don't want to do it again, let's find a similar one. No, didn't help because it was only similar. They still had to get their head around the new parameters. But if it's the same, you go, remember this? We did this a few months ago, yeah, you weren't happy? I think you'll be happy now. How do you know? Yeah, trust me, do it again. And they are happier. Nearly always, nearly always. The research proves this, that if you give them the chance to do the same thing again, they'll do it better. Haven't you ever had a conversation and gone out of it and then said, damn, I wish I'd said, when he said that, I'm, oh, if only I'd said that would have been perfect to say that, but I didn't say it, now it's too late. But if you've got a second chance, you'd be better. Give them a second chance, at least. A second chance to be good in English. Hmm. That's what I say. That, that's what coaching can provide. That's yeah. A lot of chances, actually. It certainly can one-to-one -one as well, because if you're teaching, um, then you, you've got to go at the speed of the class and you can't really hold things up for one individual. And so, yeah, I don't like working with big groups um, as a teacher. Hmm. Small groups, one-to-one, -one, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but especially online, I mean, as you've seen, I, I, I still not, uh, thank God we are now going back to face-to-face -face a bit because that's my, that's my medium. That's my sort of, you know, that's the atmosphere in which I thrive more than this. But you've got to do it and trying to learn how to look at the camera, not look at you. Sit further back and look, night's fallen while we've been talking. Right. Definitely. Okay. One, one thing relating to um, coaching groups, I think what can mm. really benefit those who attend is the reflections and the feedback that they get from each other. So like if you're doing a yes. presentation course, then, then you can help them to um, look at each other through fresh eyes, you know, and, and mm. add that. Peer feedback, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Uh, usually peer feedback is a little bit rose tinted because obviously they don't want to be nasty to each other and furthermore they're going to get feedback from them so you know what it's like it's mm -hmm. like I'll say you were good if you'll say I was um, um, so you have to be a bit careful of that mm -hmm. uh, robust feedback I think is what they appreciate that be robust Agreed. Agreed. I definitely don't do the shit sandwich you know the positive the negative and then another positive you know that thing they always say start with a positive and finish with a positive and put the negative in the middle. No, everybody knows that game. So don't do that. Um, ask them what went wrong. They'll usually be much more critical than you are. 
and then you tell them why the things they thought went wrong went wrong don't say oh yeah you're right that did that was terrible actually the way you did that no just so, yeah. no i think maybe why that could have happened i don't agree with you that it was as bad as that but if, it, it, if you think so it could be because of this you know just sort of just find the why find the why and then why was that do the five whys why was that why was that why was it what was happening what was going why did you sound nervous because i was nervous okay you were nervous but how could you not have sounded nervous i don't know are there any things you could have done you could have slowed down you could have paused more could have lowered your voice you'd still be nervous but you wouldn't sound as nervous you see you've got presence and then you've got performance presence is what you are performance is what you do to some extent you can compensate for lack of presence with performance hmm. wow. for example you know people say oh it's great if you've got lots of charisma to give a presentation now what if you haven't you just give up on that what do charismatic people do that you could copy that would make you seem more charismatic. Maybe that's all they're doing. Charismatic people generally look like they're having fun, like they'd certainly not rather be anywhere else than where they are now, just with you. And that they're really enjoying this. And you can see it coming out of them. That's charisma, but it's just doing certain things. What about gravitas? What if you want to have more gravitas? Well, then rapport is not a great thing to go for. Now you want to look like you have authority. How can you do that? Look slightly over the top of people instead of at them. Do the opposite of the rapport things, in fact, and you'll get gravitas. Now you'll be a leader, but maybe not the kind of leader people like. So, you know, different ways. All right. I will have to be. <laughs> all right so thank you everyone for being here and of thank course, you very much all of you thank you mark for spending time with us and sharing all the words of wisdom etc so yeah lots of clapping going on so thank you very much hopefully we can do a repeat at some point we'll see whatever <laughs> yeah 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 I'll, I'll get it together next time maybe we can do the same one and i'll get it right yes Brilliant. The only way to get it, and I'll, do you know what, you know how it would have gone better? Longer, more time, slow down, and more interaction, because I felt I had this kind of gun at my back. I kind of raced, but it was a choice. Could have gone slower, but then we'd have done very little. So I sort of thought, nah, just fly with it and see how it goes. Go with the flow, right. Yeah. Thank you so much, people, for giving Thank up you to much. your evening. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, to talk bye. to you again. Bye-bye. It was lovely seeing bye. you all, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs>